Hey, welcome back. It's another episode of Animation Dissection. I am Nixi here, of course, with Zorak. Hey, how you doing? Pretty well. I uh, I finished Persona 5. I didn't do it in one weekend like you predicted. It took me a week. <laughs> Jeez, you're not you're barely <laughs> even trying. Yeah, it's, it's like I've really lost my passion for it. Um, so I, I finished that um, debating doing another playthrough or perhaps moving on to another game while doing other stuff, of course. But yeah, um, it's 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 interesting. Um, I might want to do something about the series, but I haven't decided what form that will take. So you just have to stay tuned to that. But other than that, uh, checking out the the new season of shows, um, uh, not much. <laughs> There's not a lot this time around. Nope. Um, so. Other than that, uh, kind of box office news is really the only thing kind of going on at the moment. Um, Boss Baby has overperformed, um, not really doing uh, Disney levels, but considering the trouble that DreamWorks has been in, making um, about $240 million globally is pretty good for that studio. Um, the Beauty and the Beast live action remake did about $1 billion, so, you know, maybe an unfair comparison, but... Still, hey, maybe DreamWorks is not as doomed as we thought. Uh, but speaking of box office, a movie that I wasn't even aware existed called Spark a Space Tale um, did extremely poorly um, during like, a, I think it's first weekend, which is when most movies kind of make their, you know, their biggest performance push. It had a per theater average of about $300, which is pretty bad considering I think it's it's was in um, about 370 or so theaters, some maybe 380, something like that. So like, that's pretty bad. Um, that means the movie was probably being shown to a few empty rooms. <laughs> um, it's produced by a mostly international group of studios from Korea, Can Canada, and China. Um, I think the studio behind it, at least the producers, do The Nut Job and the upcoming Nut Job 2. Uh, but it, it was just weird seeing this movie kind of just suddenly come into existence and with, with no fanfare or anything. So, well, I would imagine, you know, looking at the studios that are behind it and, you know, the type of teams working on it, this is probably something that's aimed more at the, uh, Asian markets, if anything. So they, they probably don't actually care that much about how bad the performance is. I'm sure they would have taken, you know, it doing well in bed, the middle of, Hey, that's great. But, you know. You don't yeah. need the U.S. anymore to actually have a successful, you know, hit. You know, if you can penetrate into China, that's that's good enough. Well, yeah, just in terms of population, you, you got like a, a very large consumer base. I mean, essentially what's happened to the movie industry is that ancillary market has become the main market. I mean, it used to be that selling off the rights to distribute your film uh, abroad was just kind of an extra way to make money. And now it is kind of like the primary uh, source of revenue. I mean, many movies, you know, it's at least 50%, if not more, of what they totally gross. Um, and then I would also say that a lot of these films end up uh, getting their rights for a television and streaming broadcast. I mean, that's a huge amount of money for them. Like, I mean, go look at Netflix. It's pretty much filled with these kind of garbage movies or or uh, kind of internationally produced ones that get um, a bunch of celebrities to do some voices for it and kind of just shove it onto, you know, Netflix and Hulu. Yeah, it's, it's interesting in the sense that, like, the U.S., you know, it's, it certainly isn't, isn't nothing at this point or isn't, you know, nothing in the sense that, you know, you know doing well in the U.S., the U.S. is still a major market. You know, you still want to do well here. At the same time, like, you don't have to go full on, you know, just focus entirely on like, well, we have to do it this way because that's what the U.S. market will like. You know, you do have to think more broadly and cosmopolitan, which is kind of interesting since it's not like movies have become much more cosmopolitan in their actual, you know, casting. Yeah. Just that, <laughs> you know, or even it, that much in subject matter. It's just kind of like, you, apparently there are still hooks in there that just would, you know, they don't, apparently they don't really have to put much thought into it beyond the fact that like, well, you know, dumb action movies do well everywhere. It doesn't actually matter who's starring in it, but we're still going to have the same people always starring in them. 
Well, I think it's because, hey, you know, if we're just going to sell it off anyway, and because the American media arm is just so powerful that I think I think international audiences have just gotten used to the language of Hollywood film, that they can kind of accept that without having to have it be, you know, remade for local tastes or anything like that. But hey, uh, the celebrity aspect supposedly is supposed to be a big draw for American audiences. So I guess why not shoot for both is their plan. However, in some cases, we found that a lot of the celebrity casting doesn't have as much of a powerful effect as a lot of people would like to believe. Um, I, I would say, case in point, the Ghost in the Shell film, which has not exactly been received all that well, um, so and, and probably for some good reasons, but it was this idea that, hey, you know, um, the, the bad decisions that we're making here will be made up for by doing this celebrity casting when it really didn't seem to have much of an effect either way or another. You know, it's like a, we have a litmus test here, and it's kind of showing that a lot of these uh, foregone conclusions are not as conclusive, uh, eh, not as conclusive as we'd like to think. Yeah, though it's still interesting that to me the fact that like man, like Hollywood is still making their leads as white as ever, even when they're going for like even Chinese first films, like that Great Wall film from last year. Oh which yeah, which was just like ah, oh, it's a monster movie about the Great Wall, where the Great Wall exists to fight monsters. It's kind of like, okay, and it still stars Matt Damon. <laughs> you know, well, it's like, again, okay, a lot sure. of these celebrities are pretty much well-known. I mean, again, the, the U.S. pop culture industry has been kind of the dominant force for so long that I think it just be kind, kind of became somewhat of a universalized symbol, and, and celebrities are kind of well-known quite a bit. So it's kind of like... Um, Hollywood has for so long benefited from kind of a, a hegemonic situation where they just are, they're it. They are, you know, when you think of film, a lot of people just think, well, that's Hollywood. I mean, of course, you know, that, that viewpoint erases, I would say, you know, the, the Indian film industry, which is, you know, I think it's the second biggest in the world. Uh, and then you have the Chinese film industry. I mean, it. I, I think what's happening overall is kind of like I think what you were hinting at earlier is this kind of demographic change in that the U.S. audience isn't the kind of primary audience anymore. And that I think American audiences might not have to be the ones that get all the attention. I mean, it kind of reminds me a little bit of um, the gaming industry as well, where they're starting to have to acknowledge that certain demographics are not the only consumer of their product anymore. You know, and, and I'm kind of wondering if there's going to be some kind of reactionary backlash to the film industry as well, uh, starting to have them not really kind of pander to the U.S. audience anymore. I mean, it, it, they won't do it until a movie that strikes out and has extreme success for doing so. That's how mm. the that's how the U.S. film industry works. Think people won't take any risks until one film takes a risk and is rewarded from it. And then everybody goes like, what's all copy that? Because we're not going <laughs> to learn that risk taking can be rewarding. We're going to just learn that, Hey, they had the good idea. Let's do what they do. Which right. That's how these things play out. Yeah. So we're just kind of waiting for that first one to happen, but considering the, I'd say the production environment now, and just the amount of projects that are being kind of produced with that in mind, I think it will happen sooner or later. I mean, I'm not sure. saying it'll necessarily be a good movie by any means. It's just whether or not one will just do so well that it kind of breaks through whatever conventional wisdom has solidified and kind of create, I hate using this term, fucking disruption. I mean, <laughs> some kind of disruption is going to happen to the the hege hegemonic principle of you know um, Hollywood movies in structure and form as they are. Um, and, and how you kind of deal with a in increasingly internationalized audience and uh, market. So I think that's about it in terms of news. Um, I, I think we're ready to move on to today's subject, which is uh, Monster. A uh, bit of a long series again, um, you, you know, coming at the, the heels of having done uh, Legend of the Galactic Heroes, but still not not as long, but still fairly long at 74 episodes. Uh Quick history of Monster, uh, the anime was broadcast in 2004 through 2005, produced by Madhouse. Uh, the director was uh, Masayuki Kojima, and it was based upon a manga by the uh, very prolific uh, Naoki Urasawa. 
uh he uh of uh billy the bat and oh god it's it's 20th century mind. boys 20th century uh, boys that's it uh pluto yeah so uh and i think uh 20th century boys also had an animated ad- adaptation at some point uh i don't think so it's had several live action films though right okay i know it i know his stuff is um it, it's got to be kind of hard to adapt i mean it, it has an interesting stylistic element to it that I think almost does lend itself to live action, but in this case, it was. I'm kind of glad it was animated. It it yeah. has a yeah. Like it's it's monster. The anime is interesting in the sense that it's one of those animated adaptations of a manga where it's almost like frame for frame, like scene for scene <laughs> re- recreations. Where it's kind of like, look, we know what we want to do with this, and we want what we want to do is we want to take this manga. And translate it very literally and strictly into animated form. That has the plus side of that it is very, you know, faithful. It has a lot of very good scenes, in part because, you know, Urasawa is very good at framing. But it does also mean that at times it has the pacing of a literary work, which Yes. You know, um yeah, which I which I do want to get into as well. Um it, I mean it, I I think because you have read the manga and I have not, um, I will cede the the uh, that kind of observation to you in this case. So, uh, I guess I want to kind of yeah. Let's start with the pacing for this one so far. Um, it does have a little bit of um, a couple areas where it feels like it, it ends up being in a bit of a rut, or at least kind of repeats itself a few times. You get um, a few standalone kind of stories that don't necessarily go anywhere. It it they feel a little bit like filler. Um, but I kind of get why they they were there. A lot of them kind of exist to help uh, characterize Tenma as a char- as a person, although it kind of gets a little bit much. I mean, it, it's kind of selling how he's not the type of person who would kill somebody. He's this really great guy, and they kind of use a lot of these scenarios to really sell at home. Uh, the guy that's teaching him how to shoot, um, the the British couple that help uh, helps him along. The British couple episode is fantastic. I'll have you know. I mean, it's not bad. I actually I really enjoy it. The, <laughs> the, I listened to the though. I listened to the dub, which was really good. Um, I I actually really enjoyed that uh, being able to kind of listen to that. Uh, they had some pretty good voice actors for this one, and it's one of those ones where it's like. The dub, I think, is is probably just as good as the original in a lot of ways. Um, there's a few areas where I was kind of like, eh, it's a little bit unnatural. But then again, given the kind of, I think, writing style, the deliveries make a lot of sense. So, But the, the actors they got for that episode were pretty delightful. But in terms of, I'd say, advancing the larger plot, because again, you know, I'm watching these in huge chunks and I'm waiting for the next thing to kind of happen, it, it didn't necessarily advance too much directly. But again, it, it was one of those things that shows who Tenma is and how he's able to relate to other people and how he kind of rallies others around him, which ends up being how he's able to kind of succeed. So they have a purpose. So they're not entirely filler, but the pacing of it ends up becoming kind of slowed down with these kind of extra stories. They're not bad extra stories. It's just if you could edit this thing down, you could kind of remove them and not lose a lot, if sure. that makes any sense. I mean, you could make this, if you wanted to edit down severely, make this into a, you know, a series that's a fraction of its length and has you know probably a fraction of its cast and probably it would serve better as a kind of popcorn muncher sort of you know story at that point because it you know for those who aren't familiar at all with monster it is essentially a very long mystery slash psychological thriller uh, like yeah like 70, i think that's like a good accurate way. episodes and yeah. you know that description oh it's a mystery and it's a psychological thriller juxtaposition with and it's also 74 episodes long and has approximately like like 500 characters at some point or another like <laughs> like that's that's a, like yeah. those don't jive or, or very well in the sense if you think about it in the you know in the terms of like u.s cinema or you know it kind of just seems like well wow, that's gonna be too long or you're eventually going to get the kind of uh like lost treatment where it's like you know like the daytime television equivalent of a mystery where it's kind of like okay and we're, we're making up as we go we're, we're doing things that are cool in the moment and it just kind of goes wild whereas like well monster- this one's so much more considered and and yes. you definitely get Which, a sense about where it's going so you you don't feel the frustration of the mystery not being solved because 
it it feels like it is progressing towards that end. Um, I would also say that this thing has a lot of political intrigue mixed yep. in as well, which and, and um, in ways that like are very surprising in the sense like you wouldn't think like ah this Japanese series is going to have a lot of intrigue about like Czechoslovakian European and secret <laughs> police and like you know Eastern post- Germany uh, during you know the communist era and oh man I mean <laughs> and, and like ah the interplay between you know the Nazi regimes and you know the communist regimes and how like things got very fascistic at points even you know it's there's there's some weird like interesting places that things go like it the, well, the idea that, of human experimentation i mean there were a sure. lot of weird psychological experiments and really fucked up stuff during that time period and so it, it, it kind of makes a little bit of sense i mean this is of course you sure. know entirely fictionalized but it's it is far-fetched but not enough to be you know completely disbelief because it's you know it has a lot of conspiracy theory aspects to it but it's like no you know what you could almost see that happening in a in a fictionalized sense i mean this is you know it's it's more realistic than the boys from brazil let's put it that way <laughs> like yeah. considerably more in fact well you know. yeah i mean well the idea of people having attempted some kind of you know uh human genetic experiments i mean there there were people trying to do programs of you know um Eugenics. Trying to breed, yeah, eugen- uh, eugenic exercises. That that is something that people attempt. I mean, it, it doesn't, you know, result in these kinds of things, but it it was something that people have tried historically in the past. Oh, well, to be fair, and even in the context of you know this series, like there is that element to it in the background, but they also very distinctly say, actually, this doesn't really accomplish anything. What actually yeah. matters is. You know, not not you know. I don't I don't know how much we want to go into like a lot of the details about the story here or not. Uh, we could go right into it. You know. Yeah, it's- I mean, we'll we'll just go as we go. I mean, because I I, sure. I don't think summarizing everything. So we will be talking about possibly events, not necessarily in you know uh, chronological order, but just sure things that. It, and it happened. doesn't. And knowing this stuff doesn't actually impact the enjoyment at all of this thing because it's more about the journey to a certain degree and the characters. But, yeah, you the know, build the build up for a lot of them, how they change. I mean, I think um, Nina Fortner as a character ends up having a pretty good arc overall. Yeah. She ends up being very interesting. Um, and I think uh, Lunge ends up being like I think one of the big standout characters. I kind of want another series with him um, just solving something because he was very. He was very interesting in how he interacts with others and the difficulties um, he kind of has relating to them, but also having more insight than them. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Like Naoki Urasawa has a like lo- most of his works to some degree involve uh, sort of you know what makes people evil, what leads to you know crimes and horrible you know human beings, despite the fact that most people just typically want to live like relatively normal lives. And he also comes down a lot of sense of like, you know, and it is very folk central on this series, like nature versus nurture of like, what is more important? You know, he's obviously very much in the nurture camp about given every single thing that happens in this entire series. Like, Oh yes, you can make someone into a horrible, horrible human being. And also your actions and how you treat people really does matter. <laughs> Yeah, well, it reminds me a lot of crime and punishment, that kind sure. of examination about like what drives someone to do things that we don't consider you know, normal human behavior and things like that. I think what makes um, the character of Johan very interesting is that a lot of what he does is not him necessarily pulling the trigger, I mean, he, which he does, but most of what he does is he gets other people to do what he wants. I mean, his, his, um, the fact that his, his biggest you know, ability is his charisma makes him a very interesting kind of villain in the series. Um, it's, it's charisma and also the ability to really read people and understand yes. them. That's the thing. It's like he, he is very capable of like, I don't know if it necessarily the word would be relating to people, but in the sense of just kind of comprehending people and understanding them. So I he think can reading kind of, them is a good way because it yeah. feels like you're, you know, you're reading a book, you're not necessarily writing it, but you're able to kind of understand it with a distance. And it's just kind of like his whole character is that he can kind of see people and then just find like the little bit of touch in the right place to kind of slowly guide people or just get people to, you know, destroy themselves or do something in particular for him. And or, how or, tr- to- or trust him, you know, to such a heavy degree that they're willing to kind of sacrifice themselves for him. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what makes him such an interesting thing. I mean, because, you know, otherwise he would just be kind of like a serial killer that just happens to have like superhuman, um, you know, shooting ability or whatever, which wouldn't have been as interesting as this is a person who preys upon the weakness that's already there in people. That's what makes it a much more compelling thing because it's not like, you know, a person is entirely brainwashed or anything. These are existing threads that he's able to pull. And that's what makes this rumination as fascinating as it is about the nature of crime, what what will drive people to an edge, you know, the the separation between what's considered, you know, acceptable behavior and unacceptable. Like, h- how do people live in that society? And I think it really all comes together in that, uh, that final uh, arc when it's that town that he just sets at each other's throats. And yep. I think that ends up becoming such a really... I mean, that in itself could be a series on its own, is this town that has all these dangers and mysteries and, and resentments and all this stuff that's boiling underneath. And all it took was someone giving them the opportunity. That's all he really, I mean, he was really, I mean, he mostly just distributed guns when the person was at a breaking point that, he, you know, he wasn't even ma- manipulating them at. He just saw them at the right point and then gave them a gun. Like that, that is what, that is what made it so interesting and is how complicit his, you know, his victims and his collaborators are in what he's doing. So he's not this pure villain of the series. There's a lot of villains. And that one, that particular example, that final little arc in that town is also super interesting in the fact that, you know, that's a town that is specifically is addressed and called attention. Like, oh, it's like an idyllic little, you know, rural town, you know, like how, you know, it's great. You know, the whole reason we we only have one police officer. (laughs) Like the entire reason why he's going there is to get revenge on one person who fled there essentially and, you know, ultimately abandoned their, his own, you know, terrible, you know, lives and, you know, sins because like, oh, you just fell into, you know, a normal human routine just with normal people. But it just takes Johan just a, just a slight bit of manipulation to just basically turn that entire thing on its head just out of spite almost. Yeah. It has that kind of a uh, Lord of the Flies feeling to it, and I and that that's what makes it have that kind of literary feeling. I think is that it has a, a kind of a point of view and a thesis, and it explores a lot of these kind of fair, fairly dark themes, but it does them not in a superficial way because it doesn't do the whole like, "Wow, isn't this fucked up?" Like, "Wow, you like this person shot someone in the face." It's like, no, it, it's doing, it's like examining the darkness and it has, it has kind of a hopeful edge, but it's not in a naive, superficial way either. It, it, it takes its time and kind of, it doesn't necessarily provide all the right answers because it has the whole nature versus nurture aspect, but it doesn't necessarily come across one way or the other because the idea is that Johan was kind of this monster character before he even got into this horrible German German experiment. So he escapes this this Czech experiment and then lands inside of a German one. <laughs> but by that point, they had already kind of confirmed that this character, this this child, has something kind of endemic to him that made him very much like prone to this. Well, it's also more interesting the fact that they, you know, in the Czech, you know, with their experiments that they were doing with the uh, the Red Rose Mansion, it's like ult- ultimately the big twist is that. He wasn't the one of the twins that was ultimately subjected to the majority of the horrible, you know, st- you know, experiments. Yes. That was his sister. It was actually the simple decision beforehand of like, oh, who, which person are you giving up to this thing that actually really flipped the switch in his head? Like that was Sophie's like, choice. Literally- That's it. That was, it, yeah, it had that, that, Sophie's, choice that Sophie's choice was literally enough, like just abstractly and not even because like, oh, the, how he was treated despite, you know, spite or anything. It was more just the question just literally sent it to him where it was like, oh, I'm, you know, that was enough to basically say like, oh, I know what I need to do. I need to bring yeah. everything to nothing. Which yeah, is really I mean, it was, it was the shock of having been subjected to that choice was the thing that triggered him. And that's what made it so interesting. Um, I, I think it's handled really well. I think a lot of uh, that, that mystery itself is very fascinating in, in how they kind of build it up. And you don't exactly know what's going on. And the fake outs don't feel unfair. They feel really interesting. Yeah, um, it's, 
it's not like really a work with a lot of crazy twists other than the fact that, you know, occasionally, yeah, like, oh, this, this nice person gets, you know, shot or, you know, a seemingly normal person is ultimately turned, you know, in a bad direction. You know, it's more less like, oh, what a surprise and more just like a normal sort of mystery twists and turns. It, yeah. It's kind of weird that twists have gotten to be such a, you know, negative thing because they, they're <laughs> all like, you know, Shyamalan like style things, you know, often which people like just taste, you know, have a fair, you know, dislike for because, hey, that that's unnatural. That's a, you know, cheap sort of, you know, narrative instrument. Whereas like- It's here an it's, affectation. You know, yeah. it, it doesn't it doesn't feel uh, organic. It feels like it's trying too hard. I mean, I think people are subconsciously able to pick up on that. And in this case, I think this one does it as a natural thing. I mean, the character of Nina, she can't understand what really happened to her right away. It needs kind of time to boil and ha- her to kind of figure things out before she has that, you know, epiphany. So it, it it feels like it has a reason to it. Sure. And, you know, things go, you know, in, in very interesting directions. It's definitely a, you know, from the, the perspective of the manga, it's definitely a, you know, a page turner. Oh, yeah. Uh, it Like, you know, and the anime does the same thing. And, you know, honestly, that's, that's the gr- worst aspect of the anime. You know, and this is often the, you know, the challenge of very direct adaptations. You know, a Full Metal Alchemist uh, Brotherhood had a kind of a similar sort of issue in the sense that with a manga, you know, assuming you have access to all of the material, you kind of control the pace of, you know, the story and, you know, how fast things go, depending on your own reading pace. You know, you could take your time really kind of engross yourself as you go. On the other hand, you can do what I often do and just kind of blitz through things kind of at like, you know, like actually the actual, you know, you know, definition of like, hey, this is a real page turner. Whereas with an anime, you know, unless you're like scrobbling through like bits where they're, you know, moving across <laughs> scenes and transitions, you're kind of like, no, nope, no. Nope, okay. They're talking. Okay. All right. I see. Okay. Like, and, and that's not even say like you, you're not paying any attention to the manga it's more the sense of like it's easier to sort of absorb quickly and you know handle the internal pacing of scenes on your own as opposed to anime where a director made that decision which is you know for monster that you know that ends up translating to you know 74 episodes which means at times you know certain episodes you're kind of sitting in the atmosphere Makes a lot of sense. I mean, what I would say is that manga and literature are inherently an interpretive medium. Um, Your sense of time is entirely defined by how your mind processes it versus a film or an animation or a radio play. The time aspect has already been predetermined and decided. So in terms of pacing, when you're trying to translate a a, a literary piece or a, a comic to a uh, visual medium that has a temporal aspect predefined, you have to sometimes make changes for it to function. I mean, you know, just not because something works in text does not necessarily mean it works in speech. So that that is a key aspect to this. But I think it oddly works well. Like somehow this ends up working pretty well. I mean, you know, I, I mean, even though I might have, have grown a little bit about it, the pacing, in the end, I don't really hold it against it. And I'm thankful that I got to have the the kind of moments where it is drawn out a little bit. You get that time to breathe and you get this kind of uh, time to process and kind of feel a lot of things in the moment rather than having it be all about like, here's plot point, get to plot point, get got to get to the next plot point. You know, it doesn't, do that it, it feels like okay we got the plot to tell but you know here's some here's some aspects of like what it feels like to be in that moment you know getting from point a to point b it gives you a sense of flavor you sure. know and, uh, and it feels it, more natural in the sense you know like because in manga you know you're, you're reading dialogue you can read dialogue a lot faster than it actually takes for someone to emote and say dialogue you know yes a conversation on screen that lasts about two minutes which would be a pretty long sequence of dialogue, you know, you can get that done in about five minutes or what, wait, what am I saying? Yeah, well, I'd you know, say like, like maybe two seconds, pages, maybe. Yeah, you know, two pages of a comic can be, you know, two to five minutes of a dialogue and then adaptation, depending on what you want to do with the acting or the scene or you know, breaks between lines or all that. I mean, yep. you know, one drawing plus a block of text can be an entire character moment in a comic. You can't necessarily do that in animation. Nope. Um, I was also just thinking in terms of uh, characters' arcs that I thought were really interesting. I think um, Ava Heinemann's 
arc ends up being really interesting um, and, and kind of the, the vacillations that she goes through as a character. I mean, I, I think this thing really survives on having a compelling cast um, surrounding it. Uh, you, you find yep. their, their interactions, their, their thought processes are really interesting. Um, I, I think she's really a, a great character because of all the various shades that are kind of given to her. She's not entirely a villain. She's not a hero. She's, she feels like a person, you know, with all the flaws and all the benefits to it. And I, I think not exactly knowing what she's going to do and the decisions she makes, it doesn't feel like, well... You know, I don't know that because this thing is feeling chaotic and random. It's like, well, no, it's like there's so much going on with her that even I don't know what kind of decision she should make in this situation. And that's what makes her really interesting. Um, and also there's aspects to her that, you know, you don't know what she's thinking because she is going through a whole bunch and her personality is, you know, changing and her life situation is going through so much. So she ends up being a very interesting element and I'm kind of glad, I'm glad they don't drop her, uh, which is I think what other series would do. Like, you know, I think another series would just use her as, Oh, well she was an example of the good life that he lost or whatever, you know, yeah, uh, that's like, usually what these stand, you know, the, the equivalent of fridging without killing her off. Yeah. Cause know? like early on, she seems like such a kind of ancillary, like, detail of like you know uh tenma's life like oh he has a rich fiance that he's going to marry then oop he made a decision now his fiance left him you know that that could be such a throwaway thing but then they do that tiny little time jump and then reconnect and it's like oh her life has gone in not so great ways herself and then the story keeps going in just like and she keeps sticking around and getting herself involved in things in ways that are just it's it's like almost forms like I don't know if like a B plot would be really the word for it, given the fact that there's so many side plots going on at once over the course of the work. That's but they all great, tie into the main plot. That's, that's the, the great, thing. Is that's like, the great part. Like it's well, that's what I'm saying. It's like she she gets her essentially her own through line through the story, and uh, which well, is that's one why of the great I call things. it arc. Yeah, it's an arc. Well, I mean, they, ar I mean, arc. You know, that's a character arc, but I mean more in the sense of like. You wouldn't expect of all like the characters early on, like, oh, that character clearly is going to stick around and have an ongoing storyline that connects into everything and constantly weaving in and out of, you know, the main quote unquote story, you know, and ultimately she does, which is, you know, crazy. Like they, they basically introduce a very large and diverse cast that are constantly connecting and disconnecting and reconnecting over the course of the story. And, you know, Urosawa is very good at like, maintaining these large casts and just maintaining so many ongoing plot lines at once that feel really cohesive and not distracting. Yeah. I mean, and, and something that I find really kind of cool about it is that a lot of these people that end up playing a major role, they're not like these inherently heroic or beautiful people. They are fairly normal or ones that have very conflicting goals and emotions going on. I think the... Um, I think the the psychologist friend uh, or a, cl a former classmate of his ends up playing a really major point in it, and I thought he was just going to be one of those throwaway characters, but they bring him back in a lot of really interesting ways. You know, from someone who originally resented him to someone who ends up being one of his biggest defenders and plays a, a major role in you know the final arc of bringing people to him and examining all that. It's it's just really neat about who gets kind of major character status doesn't follow the normal the normal kind of roles like again like you it's like that joke people make about like how can you tell which one's the protagonist in this anime like and you have like the crowd shot and the one character the red hair that looks like kind of beautiful and things like that this one doesn't do that you don't necessarily know who's going to play a major role until you start watching it develop it doesn't it doesn't reduce these kinds of archetypes to you know, basic symbols. It doesn't utilize, it, it doesn't fall, I think, victim to the typical expectations game that we play with this type of stuff. So I, I, I very much kind of enjoyed that that aspect to it. Um, I think in terms of character design, I, I like that a lot of the characters visually, they feel like real people. You know, they have just enough little details that makes you think like, hey, yeah, I've kind of seen that kind of face before. Um, he does recycle a few of them, but again, like there, there's so many varieties in general that i don't really mind it that much yeah like in general like they he does a pretty good job about that uh you know there's only so much you can kind of do to a certain degree with you know drawed styles with you know 
you know, uh, with the manga, you know, he doesn't have the most detailed art style. He's got a pretty detailed style. You know, he's, he's not like at the level of a, uh, some of the more extreme examples of mangaka, but you know, you, you have to kind of simplify in order to actually, you know, maintain a pace of production. But yes. I think he does in general a pretty good job of making maintaining a, a cast of like what like again like five hundred people or something absurd <laughs> and actually having well again it's just enough detail faces. it's just just enough detail to be specific you know and like nobody, it, that that's really what it is is like you can identify the characters from each other by fairly subtle details for some of them I mean I think the major characters have very distinct faces I think sure you know Lunge you has do. a very yeah I mean Lunge has a very specific face uh you know uh, Ava has a very specific face but. Even some of the side characters, you go like, okay, there's just enough detail to feel, make them feel like distinct, but it's not a, it's not so much detail that you go like, I cannot imagine the character designer having to deal with this shit or the animators. And so, you also don't have a lot of the issue of like, who's that, you know, which you often yeah. do in like much, you know, large you know, series with a very large cast, you know, it, they tend to be very good about like when someone shows up, like, oh, it's that guy, you know, or they... They tend to flow things. You don't have a lot of things like, oh, this guy from a million episodes is always going to show up and we're going to expect you to know who this, this is. Like they, they tend to be very good about uh, structuring in such a way that they, if, if it is someone you haven't seen in a while, they reintroduce them in such a way that you're like, oh, yeah, I remember who that is. Now, this makes yeah. sense. Definitely. And I think also the way they're characterized. I, th I think the, the vocal performances really helped with that in that. You know, when I heard certain characters, I go like, okay, that performance feels very distinct. I mean, again, with that that uh, psychologist classmate of his, his vocal style and performance was, it was something that if I was just listening to it, I could identify that character. So I think they did a very good job in marrying both the character designs, but also the characterization pretty well. Yes. And the, the Japanese cast also were similarly very, very good. Uh, yeah. You know, um, I, I also think it's very interesting how, you know, this is a work set in, you know, Central Eastern Europe produced by, you know, a Japanese mangaka where the cast is almost entirely, you know, Bar Tenma himself, not Japanese. Yeah, you know, that was something is, I found really interesting, too. <laughs> so you have a lot of very different, you know, faces, you know, in this, both in the sense of like, you know, uh, Urasawa's style is not very typical anime where you just have like someone just walk in and just be, ah, oh, that's, that's a very kawaii face right there or something. <laughs> You know, that's not really his his thing. But even that being said, you know, there's a lot of very explicitly like, ah, that's clearly a European, you know, faces going around. You know, like people look like their ethnicities in a way that is not typically what you actually get out of manga because everybody tends to look the same unless they're black. You know, and sometimes that can be good and not sometimes that can be really, really bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it it. it it handles that kind of character design pretty well. I mean, I, I think that he took extra care in understanding that, you know, people from Europe have a certain kind of facial structure and kind of went with it. I mean, it, it feels like very well thought out character design, if that makes any sense. Yes. I think what I find really interesting about, again, I think that final arc is one of my favorite aspects is that town because it, even though it has, uh, it's not as long, you know, it's it's kind of only featured in the last, I would say, maybe eight to eight to nine episodes. It also has its own kind of expansive cast, and he's able to do a good amount of characterization in that short amount of time that you can kind of see all those pieces starting to fall into place, even yeah, for just that arc. Like it's introduced in like f essentially in five episodes, we're introduced into an entire like town, and then basically have them essentially all start dying off or killing each other in, in like, you know, a fascinating way, but it, it, to the point where it doesn't feel, you know, pointless. It doesn't feel like, you know, arbitrary. I'd arbitrary, say it doesn't yes, feel like that. that. Yeah. Where it feels very structured in, in a way that feels natural. It's like Ur Urosawa took, like you said, like what could have been itself a standalone story or a standalone part of the story and just basically manages to blow it up just at the tail end of the series. Like, it'd been so easy to not have done what he did there. Just like, oh, we'll just take their normal cast and we will just, you know, cut things down to size. But no, like, actually, we're going to introduce more people and we're going to, you know, have it make sense. And then the ultimate final conclusion of this thing will end in a way that is both natural and also just feels narratively dissonant in a great way. Like, the way that... Johan is finally stopped is like it 
it's interesting in how it's not how you might expect the story to have stopped at all from how it began. Like, oh, yes. Yeah. Yo, how does Yoan take him down? Does Tenma finally kill him? Or is he taken into custody? Like, no. A kid that he's arbitrarily holding hostage should try to kill, to convince Tenma to kill him. His drunken father sees him as a monster and shoots him in the head. And not just that, it was one of the people that he had tried to manipulate into committing the acts of murder who ends up not actually pulling, you know, committing the acts of murder that he had tried to manipulate him into. Yep. So it, it's, it's, it's a weapon that is turned upon himself um, unexpectedly. Yeah. Um, although I, th- I, th- I would say that I, I'm not sure I necessarily like the absolute end where it's the empty hospital room. I think it, that's fine because that doesn't they don't give any sort of impression about what's going on there. Like that could just be it doesn't actually have like a to be continued vibe. Like it doesn't yeah. leave any It just on some level it just felt a little bit like I don't know. It didn't it didn't feel as if conclusive have- as I would like it to be. Because again, I've I've been through seventy four episodes of this. I'm like, there's something a little bit inconclusive about it, but I, I get what you're saying. It doesn't have that to be continued aspect to it, but I wanted a bit more of a sense of finality to that I th- character. I think the thing is like, you can't, if you had that sense of finality and that this was a closed book story in the sense of like, ah, everything is as it is like by, you know, in that last episode, you know, Tenma is now innocent. Tenma has a future, you know, it is a new life he looks forward to. Everybody's doing great. Everybody's learned a lesson except for the people that are dead. And then it's, <laughs> and then just like leaving that little bit open, you know, leaving the kind of question of like, oh, mm. everything's right in the world or is it? Like, I think leaving that door at the open at the end is a perfect decision because like without that, like things are too clean. Well, at the same time, we don't. We also don't know if Johan himself has changed as well. No, because it we seems no like what's, which is kind of interesting, because he himself he, he ends up not feeling like the primary villain near the end either. I mean, he he ultimately he's the antagonist. Antagonist, yes, but he doesn't feel like entirely villainous. I mean, again, we know all the horrible shit he's done, but there's this kind of interesting understanding that the show has about him. There, there, there's an odd sympathy for him that doesn't betray the things that he's done, but you kind of understand on some level what, what made him to that point. Yeah, like he does horrible things, but the other thing is that like he's not entirely in control to a certain point. Like, yes. Because the whole big focus of the series is that, you know, like people can be essentially created. You know, you, that you can take someone who already exists with a personality that already exists and you can shape that, you know, like essentially against their will, you know, conditioning, not, not necessarily even like in the, the brainwashing sense of like, ah, oh, we, you know, subsumed who they are. Like, no, they're, no, they're like they're, it's existing. They are elements. literally changing who they are on a fundamental level. They are taking something that was originally one thing and making it entirely into another. Speaking of something, I, I one of the most interesting things that he did, I think, artistically and writing wise, were those children's books. Oh, those are crazy! I love those. Those are oh, those are amazing because I, I like the descriptions that the characters say later, and that you know they talk about what they how they make you feel just psychologically and, and the weird feeling they give you. He was actually able to recreate that effectively in these little stories it's kind of like you know if someone in a you know a tv show it's like well this person is like a genius comedy writer and then you actually see something that they write and you go like well this person's not really that good at being funny but the rest of the show is kind of treating him like they're this genius person it doesn't work but in this case it's like no the actual product that the characters are being shown and reading match that exact weird psychological feeling that that they kind of describe in those books. You could definitely understand from the context of what they show you. Like, yeah, I think if you showed, you know, or gave kids this kind of experience repeatedly over the course of years at a very young, impressionable age, you could, in fact, very much impact them in a way that may not be good. Now, yeah, it's in- but they're not outrightly creepy. That's the interesting no. thing is that, and, and it's that such a subtle needle to thread. Yeah. That is what makes them the, just really fascinating. I mean, also just the art style for them is really inventive and it feels like, yeah, that is that kind of Eastern European kids book 
kind of style. I mean, a li- albeit a little bit filtered through kind of like a Japanese interpretation of it, but it feels distinct to what what they're doing. It's I, I just found those really fascinating, and it it ends up making a lot of sense why those images are used in the ending credits for the episodes. Yeah, and it's also just interesting how so much of like what Johan does. It's just recreating those type of things, you know, and you never get the a, a great feel if he's doing it, you know, deliberately like a like a spiteful thing or if it's him being guided by like the exposure and kind of like the impact it had on his mind. Like that's the interesting thing is that obviously, you know, you could in theory shape someone to be something that they're not, but humans still have free will. Yes. So the the whole thing is like, is Johan, you know, Johan's cognizant of what was done to him. Johan is cognizant of who he is and what he is. But you never get a good f- understanding of whether or not he's actively like embracing that or if he's just being forced along that path and he's just slowly trying to, you know, go along with and kind of aim the trajectory you know well there's a part of him that's trying to destroy himself i think there's that that aspect to him where he has been trying to manipulate tenma into ending him in in the end in the end tenma is able to resist that he doesn't shoot him it's someone else that does i i think that's kind of what the big game is is that johan through all the things that he's doing he's trying to get to manipulate Tenma and something about Tenma in in internally is able to resist that. So he is the kind of person or or maybe the symbol of, you know, yes there is external influence, but we do have decisions and we do have choices that we can make in spite of those kind of circumstances. Well, I mean that whole thing is sort of interesting in the sense that like Tenma's act on Johan in that first episode where he saves his life is an act of pure compassion, you know, something that essentially Johan had never really experienced. You know, it you know, Tenma's identity where he essentially destroyed his own life because that was the right thing to do. Yeah. You know, that you know, that the question is whether or not like is he, you know, Johan impacted by that and thus trying to get, you know, Tenma to end him because he's the right person to do it or is he also in the the act trying to essentially ruin Tenma and change him, you know, reject him by saying like, "Oh, Tenma, you saved my life once, you know, in an act of pure compassion. Now as an act of compassion in order to do the right thing, you need to murder me." You know, which is completely yeah. against everything you stand for as a doctor and as a person. You have to, you know, commit you know murder you know like is that you know he's trying to you never get a feel if he's doing it out of spite or because you know like you need to stop me because that's the right thing you know johan is so fundamentally broken that it's almost impossible to tell but it's also this crazy then the fact that like everybody's expectations that they're loading on to johan just also just makes it all so strange where the whole like the nazis that try to use him yeah where everybody was like tried to create Johan to create the because they were thinking like oh well we'll genetically make an Ubermensch and he'll become like the new Fu- Führer and it's kind of like well meanwhile Franz Bonaparte doesn't actually believe any of that and he just wants to more just manipulate people's identities because he thinks that's you know interesting essentially and then those things converge and then you also have everybody still keep going forward with this fact of like yeah you know like we made him into the ultimate ultimate ruthless you know thinker you know he'll be the perfect new leader for our you know glorious you know fourth reich nationalist then, movement yes <laughs> and then johan does not give a shit and in fact just is utterly spiteful towards that entire like mindset well he doesn't like being used and i think that's the kind of big idea is that it it, it has this you know they have this idea of the end of the world. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a theme that really um, kind of becomes the forefront of, of the, the final parts of this story is the idea that humans designed this human end of the world. I mean, it, it's this, this kind of, you know, people built the atomic weapons that might eventually kill us all. It, it, but in this case, it's not a weapon. It's a human being that, that society and that humanity developed that it will possibly be the end. And especially in the sense that, like, they very much mean that literally, and that's very much a lot of the threat, you know, as things go on. It sounds like, oh, you know, Johan, if he wanted to, 
could probably manipulate himself into a position where he could cause the end of the world. And in fact, he gives every impression that that is, in fact, kind of not something that he would be disinclined to do. It's kind yeah. of like, yes, he wants to be the last person alive at the end of everything because, you know, that's the ultimate spiteful thing against humanity or because well, he that's wants what to make sure have. that it all ends. I think well, I think that's what it really what it is, is that he knows he's the only one who could do it. So he has to be the last one to be there for it to fully happen it, it leave it leaves so much up in the air about why you know like you know the monster but with not no in an name. unsatisfying way that's the thing sure, so yes. like it it, it it has the, the the vagueness there but it's not entirely unsatisfying like because it gives you it has so many subtle shades to it that you can't come up with a definite answer but you kind of feel a general direction towards it and again like you know, when I say vague, there's a lot of um, negative connotations to it, but I mean it oddly in a positive way. Like, there's a mysterious aspect to it that it doesn't feel like, well, we couldn't come up with an answer, so whatever, we'll just kind of come up with something that seems like an answer. We're not going to, you know, it seems lost, as you as you brought up, felt like that. Like, it wasn't thoughtful. It's It's vague to kind of make up for the idea that they don't have a point of view. This one has... It's it's a bit different than that. So it feels like, like there is an conscious, actual. It feels but, like there is an actual answer to everything that's going on, but they don't tell you. They merely give yes. you you know indications of like okay, here are things to think about that might lead in a direction. You know, like there, there's so much that they tell us. They give us so much evidence, but they don't actually give us the final evidence or the final answer that you can construct with this evidence. You can come up with a lot of different conclusions, and then they also heavily imply the fact like look humans aren't so clean you know psychology isn't so clean the very fact that ultimately all of their psychological experiments did not ultimately in the end really create johan ultimately johan was created more by more mundane things you know like certainly every all that stuff contributed to who he has as a person but the ultimate trigger for things was so much more un- mundane and unplanned a, b- a basic sense of betrayal was the thing. I mean, and and again, like it wasn't even him that was exposed to the primary methods of brainwashing. It was his sister, but it was the the choice uh they were being stuck in a situation where the mother had to choose and then the sister coming back and telling him what happened. Like that was it. It wasn't the actual programming that did it. There was something kind of perhaps already there that kind of brilliance and under, you know, that ability to understand things well. But it was that situational and emotional uh, wall that he was pushed against that the interest- finally caused him to lash out and and become what he is. And the interesting thing about that, like, it wasn't even necessarily betrayal. It was like doubt and like kind of like the horror of things more than anything. Like, you know, well, the adult you- world. I mean, the idea that like I, I would say, like, you know, when you're a child, you look at adults and there's an inherently trusting nature to it. I mean, you know, that's one of the things that makes you know child abuse child abuse extra scary is because you're taking someone that is inherently innocent and trusting of you know authority and the world that they brought into and you are violating and betraying that so for a child to you know have such an unjust and fucked up situation of making a child you know a parent choose in front of the children which one might possibly live or die like that that is something that is inherently shattering it, it betrays their understanding of uh, a sense of justice in the way the world works and what the adult world is and what authority means. Yeah, and it's also like, it's, it's kind of interesting how Johan is sort of an inversion of that concept in the sense mm. that he ultimately just becomes a child for a while there. He's a child who plays on that notion of like, oh, children are innocent. You know, adults are, you know, serious and don't, you know, there's something much more advanced than children. Like Johan sort of, you know, he matures or is made cognizant of the nature of the world and then uses that violently against it. Yes. And well, then he that uses, ultimately shapes uh, who he is as an adult. Well, he, he looks, I think, at the structures of the hierarchies that we use in the world, and he's able to use that against us. I mean, he, he, he finds the right people to use. He, he finds the, the right kind of uh, behaviors to uh, emulate in order to get people to – in you know, intrinsically trust him or view him in a positive or uh, elevated state. 
And I think he he definitely kind of, you know, it's very socially useful to 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 be that way. And he navigates society in an uncomfortably deft way. Like he he's able to really, you know, he the the fact that he you know if he chose to he could rise up so easily in the ranks, you know, uh, of the powerful. It, that's what makes him kind of frightening, is how how well and how easily he's able to uh, traverse that environment. Yep. So, um, I'm trying to think of what else. I mean, what, something that I, I kind of like about this is that it did make me feel like a big sense of nostalgia for... It, it, I mean, I don't know if this, this feeling is even correct, but it feels like this era of um, anime production was kind of like a golden age for me. So like you had things like Monster, you had Paranoia Agent, you had, you know, this kind of period where you'd get a lot of shows like this that we don't necessarily get as often now. And I, I don't know if my impression about that is even right or if I'm just having this vague romanticism about it because, you know, I was brought up on Serial Experiments Lane and Boogie Pop Phantom and and a lot of stuff like this. So I, I mean, I think that I'm inclined, and this is something I've ran the numbers on in the past. You are, in fact, seeing the past through rose-colored glasses because what you're right. forgetting about is the fact that, hey, this aired around the same time as, like, that – series where there was like the sodas that people wanted to screw well i mean whatever, i'm, I'm you know, entirely like, i'm entirely aware that other crap is produced it's that it's not saying like well this was a golden era of like you know this is where the only good shows are produced it's this it's the style of show that that i feel like we don't necessarily get anymore something that has that kind of literary feel to it along with um a certain kind of level of seriousness that doesn't have a self-awareness about it. It's kind of, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure how to exactly explain it, but the, it's something about this feels kind of unique to its era that we haven't. And it's not necessarily that I want like everything to be like it. It's more like I'd like to see stuff like this in addition to the new stuff that we have. Sure. If that makes I mean, any sense. Because, like, yeah, I mean, there was crap in every era. I mean, as a percentage of, of shows that are good to bad, I'm sure the percentage is relatively the same. It's that there's this specific um, kind of brooding style to things that we don't necessarily have anymore. And something that I found is, is what kind of drew me to the medium of, of Japanese animation was that they were willing to use the medium to tell these kinds of stories and have that kind of tone. And I, th- I think that's what... Um, I, I feel like is kind of missing in a, in a weird way. There's plenty of good stuff now, but it it's, it's just a different type of good. I mean, I would say that you know the, the things like Paranoia Agent and the things like Monsters, like you know, those are two one-off things from two creators that just happened yeah. and didn't really happen. You know, again, I, I think that you do see those kind of narrative spikes happen, just that you don't tend to see. You don't see a lot of that. You didn't see a lot of that in the 2000s. You're not. You didn't see a lot of them in the 2010s. You know, we got our. You know, our uh, uh, mushishis still yeah. in the 2010s. You know, we got. You know, our uh, things that are also. You know, good like Tatami Galaxy. You know, that's a very sort of narrative. Oh yeah, again, it's a different sort of, good of narrative. Stuff. Well, well I, again, I the say, feeling of that's different. I mean, again, it's, sure. I'm, I'm talking about something that it's not talking about like what's good or bad. You know, I'm talking, talking about kind of realm, like, you talk more like a grounded the, drama sort of thing. Yes, uh, a grounded drama, but with this kind of tone to it, or yeah. even this kind of sense of. I mean, and I don't mean color just visually, but I mean a sense of color in character and feeling. And again, it's not like I'm saying like you know anything that's new is, that's you know good is not pale in comparison. It's more like you know, there's certain artistic movements that exist only within the era, and you really can't recreate them. And that's what I think what I find just interesting. I mean, Th- it, I'm is, not I don't necessarily that- bemoaning it. It's just, I I kind of miss it, but I understand why it doesn't really exist anymore and how tastes have changed. And, you know, it's going to be, it, it would be really hard for a company to produce a 74 episode series that's kind of like this. Th- um, the thing is, I don't know if there was even that many like this, though. Is there the weren't, thing. but it just, but the shows that were like it were kind of produced in a certain time frame to me. I think so I, like, I have to wonder if that was purely coincidence, though. Yeah, well, I think I mean it might have been coincidental. It's just it's just interesting that it kind of happened in that rough time period. 
So, sure. I mean, because again, it might have been, and that's why I was kind of questioning myself by going like, well, am, am, is my impression of that feeling correct? Or am I kind of, you know, as I was saying, like, you know, looking at it with an odd romanticism because, you know, the stuff that first spoke to me were things like Serial Experiments Lane and Boogie Pop Phantom and, and things like this. Um, I mean, I didn't, I didn't watch Monster until recently, but I was kind of aware of shows with that kind of tone existing. Sure. And, you know, some of that was partially tied to, you know, I, I guess you kind of could see because you also had things that were more on the science fiction side of things like, you know, you had your bebops and your ghost and shell standalone complexes, which were, you know, similarly were much more grounded than most anime works are these days. You know, I, yeah. I continue, I continually bemoan the fact that so little in the way of, you know, animated works out of Japan diverged from the sense of like, oh, well, we have to have it, Starling School Children, because that, that's what our audience is, right? And they, all school children dream about what it's like to be school children, right? Or it's adults want to go back to it. I mean, yeah, and, like and that doesn't necessarily mean that those will always be bad. I mean, because again, like, you yeah. know, people could tell good stories using that type of cast. And I think there have been series that have used high school settings in a good way. I mean, High school is a common experience for a lot of people, and it's a time period where people are developing and changing. So it doesn't necessarily preclude it from being a thoughtful or smart series. It's just that it feels like it has become an affectation or a checklist of this is how we make a successful show. You know, when okay. something doesn't feel sincere in why the setting or character's um, you know uh, composition has been set the way it has. And that, that's part of the thing that's always kind of drawn me more to, you know, certainly more recently to manga over anime mm. in the sense of like, you know, manga is so much more cheap to produce. Yes. It, yeah, much I was about more, to say that. And there's so much more creator focused, you know, where there's a lot more creative, you know, uh, control, you know, particularly outside the realm of, you know, shonen, you know, obviously shonen, you know, it's very much drilled towards the, uh, the shonen style. You know, in those sorts of audiences, you know, it's all. almost liberated from the but, the yes. uh, confines of market forces. Yes, and when it comes to seinen works, that's definitely the case. Seinen and yeah. Jose works, you know, kind of they're allowed to go, you know, very much very wild in terms of the subject matter. They're able to be super strange and you know go in places that don't necessarily feel fit within you know the confines. You know, Naoki Urasawa keeps producing works that are of the style of monster and if you enjoyed monster i i definitely recommend checking oh, yeah. out some of his other manga you know he one of my favorite works of his is literally him taking an old work from you know uh astro boy an astro boy mm, story arc pluto right yes and then making it serious and it is a fantastic super short you know relatively super short it's like eight volumes like a very contained tight narrative that is very fascinating in how you know he's able to take do that sort of thing and consistently just make these mysteries that are just very nuanced and just great and he just keeps making these things like that's and he often has multiple of these things running at the same time. I like, think he's insane. I don't know how he can do it. Like but he's he a does. very good like mystery writer. Like uh, there's yeah. There's, there's some interesting uh, interviews that have happened with him, like talking with uh, I forget what the other mangaka he was talking with, like talking about like the production style, about how like people like kill themselves with manga, and he he oh, manages yeah. with his art style to maintain things, you know, keep things a little constrained. He does the monthly thing, you know, where he's not necessarily destroying himself continually, but like it's super. Like these sorts of works are great, and you know, and like yes. It's kind of sad we don't get anime about them as much lately. Uh, though, like I said, I don't know how often we got them in the first place. But like, yeah. I, I'm just glad that they still happen now and again in some form, even if yes. it's not an animation form. These kinds of um, artistic creations that enter, you know, the the canon of well thought art still exist at least in some form. Yeah, and that's like what it's. Monster in a lot of Urasawa's works and a lot of the other works I produce that are that sort of style, it's super interesting in how, like, other, you know, so much of Japanese works, and, you know, this is true of the US as well, like, you know, is focused in their locality and in their area of understanding and their experience, you know. It's so much like Japanese works produced in Japan are about Japan. They're about either Japanese history 
or they're about Japanese modern day and they either layer fantasy on it or they don't, you know, that's it. That's typically all there is. But then there are these weird things like monster where it's like, yeah, this is my work set in uh, central Europe and it's going it's to be actually super- researched and thought out and feels coherent to the play, the setting they have chosen. Yeah. I, I t- clearly did research. I clearly went to Europe to, to, you know, map things out and think about how things are. And I made something that was very well con- contained. Well, very well constrained within, you know, the, the characters and what makes sense. And you don't get taken out of the story by the fact that this is being produced by a Japanese person who may not be familiar with that, you know. But it's also interesting in the sense that, like, in reality, I probably wouldn't be able to tell if, you know, Naoki Urosawa, you know, fudged things in Czechoslovakia at all. Yeah. Like, I don't have that experience <laughs> base, you know, just because, like, oh, I'm white, so I would know, you know. But, it, like, but no. it, it, it just feels right. I mean, again, it's that. It does that, feel right. It's that. Uh, when I say the phrase just the right amount of detail, it's that kind of, you know, I'm a big fan of verisimilitude where it feels real even if it's not like photorealistically rendered. And I'm not just talking about visually, I'm talking in terms of just the observations and style uh, of something. Having just enough to feel specific, but without feeling like ultra specific. It's that it's that level of, of reality where you you know it's constructed, but it's constructed from a understandable and grounded perspective. And I think that's what he's able to do. So he might get maybe certain details of Prague incorrect, but there's just enough there that you go, you know what, I I, I believe in it. I, I understand what he's going for here, and it feels real enough. Yes. And that's what I find really interesting. And and that's and I think that is a, a very you know, that's one of my favorite qualities of, you know, good artists is being able to do that, to be able to bring you to a world with just enough detail to be believable without um, closing off the reader's imagination of filling in the rest of the blanks. Because again, you know, you could totally just do photography if you wanted, you know, perfectly photorealistic impressions of things. But having, you know, that balance of reader imagination and viewer imagination and, the artist's observation of reality. That's what makes it really interesting to me. So I think overall, Monster is a highly suggested thing. I think it's definitely um, become one of my favorite series so far. Um, I mean, I, I, I'd i still say like, you know, I have my favorites list, but this has definitely um, become a part of my, hey, if you want to check out some good shows, like this is one of them. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's so like the, the it's so easily to recommend in the sense also like it being even long, the dub is good like yeah, the, you the could dub totally is good. Yeah, and the dub so is good it's not like it any without... other anime it's very serious it's set in europe there's no like dumb anime robot things happening and i like dumb anime robots but like it's such an easy thing to recommend in that sense like yep completely divorced from all the things that people dislike about anime has all the things that people like to shout about like ah this is the great things that anime can accomplish that western animation can't yeah, well, I mean, I would say, like, even if someone who's not into anime, like, you could re- re- recommend this series to a person who likes thrillers and mysteries. Like, yep. it, it it doesn't have the kinds of symbolic tropes that alienate general audiences from a lot of, you know, Japanese animation. This is able to be enjoyed by a wider variety of people, I think, than the typical show is. So, like, I could probably recommend this to, like, I don't know, my parents or an aunt. Like, it's like, hey, did you like Poirot? Do you like, you know, a lot of this? St- like, you would re- actually like this. I mean, it's a shame it's it's not as easily available as it could be, but it it's one of those ones where, like, yeah, I could easily recommend it to someone who is not familiar with the medium at all. It's not surprising at all that like multiple like studios and like Guillermo del Toro have repeatedly been trying to make movies and like live action series in the HBO style of Monster. Like that, it's not surprising that's happened because it, like to a certain degree, like it feels well, well they could for that, or they could have just actually put it on there. But to be fair, this did air on U.S. television on Sci Fi, which is a yeah. weird fit, but sure. Well, I mean, sci-fi used to have a. I mean, e- even Adult Swim aired Paranoia Agent at one point. So, like, well, I mean, for the sense, like, this is not really a sci-fi show. No, but they also were the only network that were was broadcasting anime for a short period. Like, that yep. was just, you know, hey. <laughs> so, yeah, 
Yeah. I mean, it's one of those ones I highly suggest. So if if you do have an opportunity to watch it, you know, I would say do so. Um, it, it's well worth it. It is. Yes, it's 74 episodes, but, you know, people watch all of Game of Thrones and shit. So why not watch this? Yeah. And like I said, that if you're the person that is more inclined to read uh, the written sort of comic form, uh, they are almost literally one to one. You know, that yeah. you can do you're not missing anything plot wise or, or extra detail. It's, yep, so it's yeah. literally just your chosen method of consuming media. If you'd prefer to have something you can, you know, listen to or watch in the background, or if you prefer the animated thing to get the full, you know, audio visual experience, the soundtrack is pretty good as well. Oh yeah, That's that opening. Oh yep. man, the haunting. opening theme is really good. You know, like the ma- the ending theme is very good. Like the general soundtrack, you know, it's not necessarily transcendental. Where you know, L, but it you know, it's so it, well. Like it it's fits so, so moody. Well. Yep. Yeah, it, it's yeah. <laughs> so, so it, like um, it's entirely your means of you know consuming and hey if you enjoy it hey check out some of those other written works they're good yep uh, uh billy the bat was one of his more recent ones i think yeah i, I don't remember when billy it wrapped up yeah i had a friend who was really into it so i have to i have to check that out sometime um so uh let's talk about what we're going to do next time which is going to be daria uh the mtv animated series uh one of the reasons i picked it is it recently uh turned 20 how old do you feel? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so for, for Daria, uh, it is released on DVD. And also uh, you can watch it on the MTV website. I think they make you sign into whatever cable provider. Uh, if not, somewhere. But it is available uh, uh, commercially uh, at the moment. It took forever to get it on there. And unfortunately, they had to subtract the uh, original music because of rights and copyright's terrible and the way, the way it's authored Ugh. in the US. But it, it, it's, you know, it's still at least it's, it's all there. So and it's also not cut down. Um, it, it, there was a rebroadcast of it on another network where they cut out a lot of content. So it is available. Uh, so that is what we'll be discussing next time. Uh, Zorak, do you got any uh, projects and uh, things to plug? Uh, not really at the moment. Uh, really worth mentioning. So, All right. Well, uh, you can always catch these episodes either through iTunes, uh, which you can subscribe to, rate, and review. We also put higher quality versions up on YouTube. So if you really want to hear the, the luxurious tones of our voices in full 240K or 320, I don't remember what I output to but it is available on youtube at zorak goes on uh you can also reach us on twitter mine is at ry magnuson and i'm sazerac uh you can also email us at ad the podcast at gmail.com uh for suggestions of series that you think would be interesting to check out so i always check it and uh add it to my list of things to to look at so definitely uh let us know how you feel um I guess that's it. We will see you guys next time.